But Voicea has built something that's like a virtual assistant that listens to you, but it doesn't just transcribe things. Uh, it actually understands intent and helps you manage the conversation. So it's really cool. I checked it out. Uh, so I want to introduce Omar. Let's give him a warm welcome. Okay. Hi, Omar. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about two topics today. Uh, I'm going to really quick introduce um, my journey before this. I built a, a B2B company that had an exit and a little bit about the experience there. And then I'm going to jump into uh, Voicea. Uh, so uh, please be here. I, I'm the CEO of a company called Voicea. Before this, I started a company called Blue Kai, which was in the uh, marketing uh, space and was acquired by Oracle and became the Oracle Data Cloud. Anyone here from the marketing industry, ad industry, anything? All right, cool. Yeah, so uh, while they're getting the slides up there, it was, a, it was a really interesting journey. We started out in 2008 when most advertising was uh, contextually based advertising and we had a thesis that we could change the way people bought ads by uh, giving you the ability to um, target ads based on people, not based on places. And so we built a data marketplace where um, people like Expedia and Kayak and eBay could provide the data, and advertisers uh, through Google, Microsoft, Facebook could acquire the data and target ads. And very quickly over a, a short period of time, all those damn shoes started following you everywhere you went, where you'd look at a shoe on a commerce page and you'd see retargeted ads. Uh, we were one of the, the biggest providers of the data that drove that. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, and so what happened, uh, we started in 2008, and it was a blue ocean. Anyone here read Blue Ocean Strategies, the book? Yeah, and basically Blue Ocean uh, thesis is that you enter, you create a new market rather than going into an old market with lots of sharks and lots of blood. And so we kind of had this idea that we weren't going to sell any ads. We were going to never compete with anyone in the ad ecosystem, but we were going to supply data to all of them. Uh, and uh, it actually worked. Most companies competing with us at that time didn't believe that you could sell data, that they thought you had to sell data through ads, and instead we provided the data to the people who, who ran the ads. And we took off and we grew uh, quite fast. Um, interesting thing happened, though, is that we had this thesis that a lot of people had um, data, but they didn't know how to plug it into the ad ecosystem, which is a very dynamic uh, ecosystem. And we thought there would be this new thing called the data management platform that it would commoditize our business. So the reason I put polar bears here is people think polar bears are cute, but actually polar bears eat their children. And so from a strategy perspective, we looked at it and said, um, if someone were to go create a really good da data management platform, they would commoditize our business. So why don't we commoditize our own business? We built it, and that actually uh, grew faster and it took us to profitability. And in 2014, I really till now can't explain why, three companies, public companies, came and asked to acquire us within two week period. I, really, I have no clue why. All the just meetings started showing up on my calendar. There was no banker involved at that time. Uh, so we entered a process, Oracle acquired us. Um, started 2013, 2014, they acquired us. Uh, then I met uh, Larry Ellison. He, basically put me in charge of a group called the Oracle Data Cloud. We went out and acquired some more companies. It became a $500 million business. It was a lot of fun. But when I built that business, I started to realize that even though we were generating about $500 million in revenue off of data, that the ecosystem on top of us that built the end-to-end uh, -end value was you know, five to $10 billion of value. And so what I wanted to do in my next company is build kind of an end-to-end uh, an company that has a data advantage and an AI advantage, and that's what I'm going to chat about here. Sorry. All right, so I'm going to start with a question. So something really interesting happened last year, uh, this month. There was a baby called Joe Brady who uttered uh, his first words, and it wasn't mom or dad. Anybody want to guess what, what it was? Yeah, someone said Alexa. Exactly. Uh, it was Alexa, which is really embarrassing. I, I've got four daughters. Thank God they, they didn't say Alexa, and they said their, their mom and dad's names. Uh, but, uh, but this is a real thing. And why is that happening? Because voice is becoming quickly the new kind of dominant UI for a whole new generation of consumers. And people know what that looks like at, at home, right? You go in, you say, you know, Alexa, play a song, turn on the lights, set a timer. But people haven't really thought that through about what that's going to look like at work. 
Uh, and we did, and we sat back and we said, how would that be different in work when you're sitting in a meeting? Where do you spend most of your time in, in a company? You spend it in meetings. And um, you don't want to interrupt seven people in a meeting to give a command. Uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So what would that look like? So first off, we looked and said, how do people perceive meetings? This is autocomplete on Google. Uh, I didn't make this up. Basically, they're telling you it's a waste of time. Yet, execs spend more than 50% of the time. A average employees spend 37% of the time in meetings. If you were to ask a CFO where the largest indirect cost, it would be labor time. Yet, we think meetings suck and they're ineffective. And we know we, we need them. So our goal was to fix that, to make meetings time well spent by creating an enterprise voice assistant, Eva, that looks at your calendar, joins your meetings as a participant, and basically has your back and reverses the trend of a lot of collaboration software. People here use Slack or Teams or anything like that. The technologies are great, but they're an, they're, they just assault your attention. If you try to do any deep work, the notifications are constantly pulling you away and interrupting you. We wanted to reverse that by saying, if you're in a meeting, just focus on the people, focus on the conversation. You don't have to have your laptop open. A lot of people have their laptop open and they're starting off taking notes and then email, text notification, Facebook, and their IQ drops by 15 points when they're multitasking. So our whole point is, is put that aside, focus on the conversation, Eva's got your back, we'll capture the, the, the recording, we'll capture the video, we'll transcribe it, we'll even help you identify important moments and we can update your Trello board, your Asana board, your Salesforce board before you've ever left the meeting. So that's what we try to do. In essence, what we're trying to do is build an inbox. I call it the conversations inbox that captures every phone call you want to capture, every one-on-one, -on -one, any conference call meeting that's for your team, conference call meeting for people around you, not just you, and you get that meeting in your inbox. So first thing, it allows you to focus. Second thing, it allows you to do the opposite of FOMO. People have the fear of missing out, so they go to more meetings than you need to. Our goal is to give you the joy of missing out. You double booked, no problem. Eva will go for you. You'll get a two-minute summary of what you missed. And so um, it's starting to build a, a new way of doing meetings, and hopefully will make you more efficient, and maybe even attend fewer meetings. So is it working? Last year, we grew about 100x, uh, and all of our key, me key metrics were used in more than 10,000 companies. We're kind of like how Slack or Dropbox or Yammer grew. I call it consumerized B2B. It's bottoms up. Anybody can use us. We have a free product, and then when we notice a lot of people using us in a domain, the sales team will engage and try to sell them a Teams version. Say 23 of the top 30 companies have people that use us, so it's, it's growing quite fast. Google, Cisco, Salesforce, Microsoft, and Workday invested in our Series A last year. What I want to do is talk to you about lessons uh, that I learned, but, um, and the rest of the talk is just about lessons learned uh, building this AI building previous companies. So anytime you want to interrupt and ask a question, um, you don't have to wait till the end. And if I get to the end and nobody asks a question, then, um, then, then I've failed you. So that's my challenge. So the first thing is we've built this product. What we realize is something really interesting about people's speech. In their mind, they sound like Martin Luther King or Shakespeare. But when they see the transcript, it, you don't sound anything like that. I don't sound anything like that. Most of the time when the meetings, our grammar kind of sucks. Uh, you're interrupting each other. Some of your thoughts are incomplete. You repeat yourself. We had someone who had a very uh, senior role in one of the, one of the biggest consulting companies you know, saw their, the transcript. They go, this thing makes me look ditzy. So we had them play the audio of the part they were talking about. And it was 100%. It was exactly what they said. So in, in that world where your speech Oh, and that's assuming the transcript's 100% right. Transcription in multi-speaker meetings is a very ugly problem. All the big companies will talk about 90, 95% accuracy rates. That is not true. In multi-speaker meetings, they're in the 70s in terms of accuracy. The problem is so difficult that when we take multiple human transcribers who are professional and ask them to transcribe the same multi-speaker meeting, their error rate against each other is 16%. So it's a it's a hard problem. So when you have to design a UI where um, almost nobody can agree on exactly what was said in the course of an hour meeting, what do you do? So this is something we, we learned after a while that it wasn't just the AI, it was how you presented it. We started out with um, a full text document that showed you the transcript. It wasn't speaker separated. And what that did is it brought out all the ugliness of the conversation. 
And then what we did is we evolved to making it navigatable. You come in here and all of a sudden you have a topic cloud. You can quickly get to every moment you talked about Google or you talked about search and it takes you right to the text. It brings the video up and the uh, audio auto plays. So you've immersed them into the environment they were in when they had the meeting and now it's less about our transcripts and it's more about you hearing yourself and seeing what was on the screen. So that's number one. You don't see the uh, video screen here but it's, uh, it would in the, in the real thing be on the bottom left. Um, the second thing we did is we started creating um, voice prints so that we can automatically recognize who's speaking and then tag the speech with the voice prints. And the third, and you don't see this because of the coloring here, these are actually in speech bubbles. So we did some studies on how people perceive speech. When you put them in a speech bubble, actually Facebook did some good work here, and that's why they changed their UI a while back. To increase commenting, they put them in speech bubbles because you tend to think that it's a little bit more casual as opposed to when it looks like a document. And when, it's, when you think that it's not casual, you overthink things. So same thing here, we put them into speech bubbles, we tagged the name, we put a picture, we made it navigatable, and we saw the NPS go up. So um, whereas a lot of times your AI team is gonna wanna focus on accuracy, which they should, you should have a bunch of people in your team who are just thinking about, given a constant accuracy number, I can still impact perception in a major way by how I present it. The second thing um, that we started learning is about this, what I call this, this pendulum swing um, between lean back predictive experiences and lean forward experiences where you wait for the user to initiate. So um, I heard a story, uh, Google invested in us, and they told us a story that when they first created Google, they were very careful to set the expectations to be, hey, um, they didn't set the expectation to come here, ask a question, and I'm gonna give you an answer. That's not what they did. They said, come here, put in a keyword or two, and I'm gonna give you 10 links and maybe one of them is gonna be what you're looking for. That expectation setting was very different, and they crushed it. If you think about what Alexa did after Steve Jobs passed away, they got the world's best actors and actresses get up and have these long conversations with Siri. What, ex what did that do to your expectation? Did, did you guys love it? Anybody? I see some people nodding no. No, I think they actually uh, messed up. I think they set the expectation too high, and I think Alexa got it right. Uh, at least in their initial launch, and then they built a, uh, very successfully on that, is you basically would walk in and you'd say, play a song, set a timer, a very uh, constrained set of actions that you would do, and then they built up and, and grew with that. So you have to be very careful how you set expectations, and we've learned the hard way in this pendulum swinging. We started out where everything was lean forward. You'd have to come in and you'd basically say, okay, Eva, the action item here is for send a contract, which is very lean forward, but we know when you wanna speak to Eva. Then some CEOs came to us and said, no, 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 I want to completely lean back. I want Eva to join my meeting, actually uh, get everything, and then correctly identify actions without me telling Eva, which is completely lean back. And you have to predict that you think an action item or a decision has been made, which is a much, much, much harder problem. And so what we did is we figured out how to do both. Um, in, the, in the main, if you're in a meeting and you uh, pull out the app and you just press the button, at any time it'll capture that piece of speech. Obviously it captures the whole speech, but it'll highlight that piece of speech. If you give a voice command, like if you say, okay, Eva, create a task for me to send the contract, it'll actually log into your Trello board and put that in there. Or if you say, okay, Eva, ask everyone to join, it'll email everybody to join. Or if you say, schedule a meeting for the same participants for next week, it'll do that. So it, there are some things where, where it makes sense to have a, um, a lean forward experience where people will interrupt a meeting and say it, and they will only do those interruptions at the right time when it's socially reasonable. When someone says, hey, send me a contract or schedule the meeting, you can say, okay, Eva, do it. But there's a whole other set of interactions where you don't wanna interrupt, and in that case, what we do is we set up these personalized triggers where you get to choose your category of triggers, whether it's finance or project management or sales or whatever, and we'll listen to those words that are triggers for you, and then we'll create this panel highlight reel on the right that's automatic, that pulls in things that look like they're relevant to you, like actions and decisions and um, contracts, um, but they're only recommended. We even have a personalization algorithm that recommends um, stuff. And so if you like what it recommends, you swipe left and then it becomes available to workflow. It automatically goes wherever you've set up your stuff for it to go, whether it's OneNote or, or Trello or so on. So there's this, this nice balance between 
Um, well, lean forward, uh, you give a command or you tap and, it, and it's intentful versus uh, AI predicting what you want, making it available for you to, if you want, do something about it. And when you get that wrong, you overwhelm people with your predictions and you automatically send them out to everybody and it's a bit noisy. So that's one of the really interesting areas about AI design is learning how to balance um, you, you know, the, the saying, if, if, if we had done what people asked, we would have built a, a mechanical horse. It's the same thing here. People will ask for things, and you, do, you, you need to be a little bit careful about how you answer it. Uh, you would mute and, uh, you know, probably discuss amongst yourselves and then get back to the call if the client is on the other side. How would AWA, uh, you know, detect that, or how would, how would this come into picture? Uh, first of all, I have to thank you twice. One, you asked the question, so thank you. <laughs> um, the second one is, it's as if you knew what was coming next. Um, so uh, all this interesting stuff about creating socially safe recordings, like what does it mean for this meeting to be recorded? So. Um, to answer this specific question, that's easy. Eva's a participant and Eva will be muted just like the other participants at that point when you did the local mute. But to answer the question behind the question, first thing we did is we're really in, in your face. Eva will um, email the participants saying they're coming there. Obviously, you can control those settings. You can say, Eva, don't be noisy, don't email people. But the default is it'll email it saying everybody. Uh, as long as the host invites, Eva will email people saying I'm going to be there. So one, you, you know you're there. Second, Eva shows up as a video component. It actually it projects. And you're like, okay, it's kind of clear that's not a human, so you, you now know there's something there. Third is it announces itself. Uh, and then the fourth is it does something that's kind of, um, people thought was controversial when we first did it, because nobody has this design pattern, but it, it now is like making a lot of sense. Anybody who joins the meeting, who's on the calendar, can delete the whole meeting for everybody. Why? It's our collective voice in that meeting. And if somebody feels uncomfortable, they should have the rights protected. So we figured it would be better to err on the rights of participants rather than only err on the rights of the corporation. People would be less comfortable, because this is not a top-down tool, it's a bottoms-up tool. We want people to love it. Then we created something that we call Vegas mode. Basically what happens in the meeting stays in the meeting. So if anybody in the meeting's talking and you feel it's too confidential, you could say, okay, Eva, switch to Vegas mode, or you can press a button. And what'll happen is the audio gets deleted, the video gets deleted, and the transcript gets deleted. The only thing that stays are the action items, the things that you explicitly ask for. Um, and uh, one of our financial institutions, their default is everything is in Vegas mode, unless you flip it the other way. So we've been very sensitive to think through how do you make this socially safe? So the other thing is Eva doesn't come into a meeting and says, it's not just about presenting and saying, hey, I'm recording it so I can hold this against you next month. The whole thing that you want to do with Eva is say, um, I'm here so you can focus on the meeting. I will also be recording and transcribing. So great question, thank you. Um, so basically, if you think through the future of work that this is going to enable is it's voice first changes the paradigm. You remember back in 2012, Twitter and Facebook decided to design for mobile first and then web, and it changed how people thought through mobile first UI. We're doing the same thing for voice. You think through a UI where the voice interaction is the UI. Second, you build for mobile. Third, you build for web. What does that change? People have been critiquing Amazon for this idea that they've been listening to Alexa and correcting how Alexa speaks. And I understand the privacy concerns, we do things a little bit different because it's our enterprise data, not ours, so we have to be even more sensitive than Amazon. But the one thing they did right is if you ask for Alexa to do something and you say, Alexa, the lights turn on, let's say that's a common query. They're now gonna adjust and understand that that's a legitimate way for you to say, turn the lights on. So philosophically, that means the designer of the device, their job is to understand you and make the thing work, as opposed to building an interface where you're continually training the user to understand your interface. You see that inversion? It's very important for how you design voice interfaces. And I think that's gonna change how uh, we design a lot of uh, AI. The other things we're gonna start to see is multiple AIs coordinating. Alexa will ask Eva, Eva will ask Alexa, Alexa, will, okay, Google will ask uh, Cortana. And you're starting to see these partnerships merge, as opposed to having only one AI in the marketplace. Um, I'm gonna end with something which has nothing to do with the business of what I'm doing. 
It is basically what I call my journey of unlearning. Um, Noam Chomsky used to say that highly educated people can sometimes be highly indoctrinated people, and I find that to be incredibly true. That you go through uh, sort of higher education and then you continue your education sitting with all these like high-powered execs and you start repeating the same stuff and you start to believe it. Um, and I'm gonna share with you some of the stuff that uh, I've been trained on uh, that I think is totally useless. So the first one is, um, I remember when I was a kid, um, my father came to me, I was in Egypt at the time, and he said, hey, if you get into a really good university like MIT, I'll pay for it. So I got in, uh, and I thought to myself, wow, I did a great job. Like, not many people in my school have ever been to, to MIT. I, I did a great job. And that was really the wrong narrative. The right narrative was, first of all, my, my father, I had a father. <laughs> Let's start with that. Second, he challenged me. He, you know, he, di he didn't ask me, you know, where we're going out drinking this weekend. He basically said, work hard and, and I'll support it. So he set a goal for me. So there's all these things in the narrative we get taught as we're going on along the way that basically boils down to you're a badass, your future's in your control, it's only because of you. And I get that, that motivates us, but it makes us blind to the idea that you aren't really pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. And that narrative in the startup community and, and the universities that feed into it, um, I think overwhelmingly makes you, makes you focus on what a badass you are and, and forget the fact that you have all these environmental advantages that other people don't have. So that's one thing. The other one is there was a person writing a book about hero CEOs and uh, someone recommended that he interview me and my whole point was, no, it, like, you shouldn't be calling the CEO the hero because if the CEO's the hero, they've done something wrong. Like their team should be really the reason they're succeeding and their, their goal should be to elevate their team and have a really good team that challenges itself. And that kind of CEO mentality where the CEO gets 300 the pay of the lowest paid employee or 3,000 um, is a problematic uh, piece of, of our education. Um, another piece of thinking that we continually get ingrained in is this idea of being heat-seeking missiles to all our goals, which, of course, how are you gonna achieve your goals if you're not that? But remember that you have to go home and have a life at some point. So if you're a heat-seeking missile to your goal, that incredible amount of time you're in a startup, and then we're all badass CEOs who have to work out seven days a week, we also have to take that you know, one to two hours to work out, and then we have to go to networking events, and then we have to um, you know, do these uh, meditations and do all these things, and you've got two, three, four kids, and they've got questions about their next exam, how are you gonna answer that? So like, getting that balance in mind doesn't fit the narrative. You, you, even CEOs in the Valley, we start to all look the same. Everybody's fit, everybody's going to like, um, uh, uh, all these type of self-help things, and that's great, I get it, but there has to be another narrative about taking care of the people around you. Like, it'll make your life a lot happier and you'll be able to succeed and do multiple uh, startups. Anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, just wanted to leave that thought about uh, don't buy the narrative that we're all taught. Look a lot deeper and just because you're highly educated doesn't usually mean that you're actually questioning the fundamentals that everybody around you is, is kind of spewing out. Um, thank you uh, for your time. Oh.